Well, hi, everybody. This is Don Stewart, and welcome to episode two of What Everyone Needs to Know About Jesus. The last time we saw that Jesus Christ was the theme of the Bible, the entire scripture was about him. Like we said, scripture is a great hymn book. Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. All right, if the entire scripture testifies about Jesus, then according to the New Testament, who precisely is he? And that's question number three. All right, whenever we read any book, our goal should always be to discover the intention or the purpose of the author. As far as the New Testament is concerned, the main character, of course, is Jesus Christ, and the New Testament was written to create belief in him. This is the claim that it makes for itself. John stated this clearly in his gospel as he wrote the following in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. That's John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, basically John stating the purpose of the Gospel of John. Now, these verses are highly instructive. John's purpose in writing was to create in his readers belief in Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. Now, notice in doing so, he tells us that he was selective in the signs that he recorded about the life and ministry of Jesus, but that the signs that were given were meant to cause the reader to believe. This is his stated purpose. Now, the remainder of the New Testament echoes the same purpose. Therefore, we should attempt to discover what Jesus, the main character, actually said and what he did. All right, our first point is the claim of the four Gospels. There is only one way to reach the one God. When Jesus came to earth, that is, God the Son came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, he made a variety of claims about himself. One thing that Jesus claimed was that he himself was the only possible way that a person could have a relationship with the one true God. Again, this is the claim of Jesus. Now, there are many people who do not like this assertion because it seems so narrow-minded. Now, others try to deny that Jesus said this or actually meant this. However, the record is clear. Indeed, whether a person likes it or not, Jesus made the colossal claim that nobody, and that is nobody, could know the living God except by means of him. Jesus said the following to the religious leaders of his day, as recorded in John's gospel. This is why I said to you, you will die with your sins unforgiven. If you don't have faith in me for who I am, you will die and your sins will not be forgiven. That's John chapter 8 and verse 24. Now, Jesus could not be clear. Unless a person has faith or believes in him, they will not have their sins forgiven. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus said the following to his disciples who were gathered with him in the upper room. In John's gospel, it says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's John 14, 1. So Jesus told people to believe in him. Now, our next point, Jesus is the one way to get to the one God. In another place, Jesus made it clear that he was the one way to reach the one true God. We read the following in John's gospel. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the famous verse of John 14, 6. Now, notice how exclusive Jesus' claim is. Nobody can reach the Father except through him. This is what Jesus claimed about himself. Now, we also find that those who believe in Jesus already have eternal life. On another occasion, Christ said that those who believed in him have passed from death to life. In other words, they already have eternal life. John 5, 24 and 25 says, For truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly I tell you, the hour is coming, and now is here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will live. That's John 5, 24 and 25. So anyone who has trusted Jesus as their Savior 
presently has eternal life. This is the claim of the Lord Jesus. Now, elsewhere, Jesus said that those who reject him will receive the punishment of God. We read these difficult words also in John's gospel. It says the following, the one who believes in the son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe in the son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. That's John 3, 36. God's wrath will remain upon those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is crucial that humans put their faith in him if they want to have their sins forgiven and to have everlasting life. Now, again, we want to stress these are Jesus' claims. These are not our claims. We are not making these claims up. He is the one who has said this about himself. Consequently, these claims must be dealt with. Now let's go apart from the Gospels and read the book of Acts and see what it has to say. Not only did the Lord Jesus make exclusive claims about himself, we also find that the various speakers in the book of Acts did exactly the same thing. In other words, they claimed that Jesus was the only way to get to the one God. For example, the Apostle Peter said the following to the religious leaders who had arrested him. Salvation is found in no one else. For as there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That's Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Now, the translation God's word puts it this way. No one else can save us. Indeed, we can be saved only by the power of the one named Jesus and not by any other person. That's Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the translation God's word. Now, note well Jesus' claim here. There is no salvation outside of the person of Jesus Christ. He is the only way by which a person can be saved. This echoes again what Jesus said about himself. He is the one way to reach the one God. So what Peter said here in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that there's no salvation apart from Jesus, is merely echoing the claims that Jesus made in the four Gospels. One way to get to the one God. Now, not only in the book of Acts do we find these claims, we find the Apostle Paul saying the same thing. The writings of Paul continue this same line of teaching. He stated that Jesus Christ was the only way to reach the one true God. He wrote the following to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one intermediary between God and humanity, Christ Jesus himself human. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. So Paul said Jesus was the one intermediary, the one go, the one go between that is, between God and the human race. In other words, if a person wants to reach God, that person must go through Jesus Christ. When the apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he taught that there is only one way again and that's through Jesus Christ where a person could receive the gift of eternal life. He put it this way in the famous Romans 6:23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation, of course, is a free gift from God to those who place their faith in Jesus. You and I cannot earn it. No matter how good we are, we're just not good enough. We can only receive the benefit of what Jesus accomplished on our behalf by believing in him. Later in Romans, Paul wrote of the necessity to believe in Christ. He stated it the following way in the 10th chapter. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and thus has righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses and thus has salvation. Romans 10, 9, and 10. So again, we find the stresses upon believing in Jesus for salvation. According to scripture, there is only one God who exists and only one way to reach that one God. And that again is through the person of Jesus Christ. Now we go on to the testimony of the book of Hebrews. There is still more. The writer to the Hebrews emphasized that Jesus alone saves those who come to God. Hebrews 7.25 reads, Therefore he is able once and forever to save everyone who comes to God through him. 
He lives forever to plead with God on their behalf. That's Hebrews 7.25. Jesus saves every person. Note this, every person who comes to God the Father through him. There are no exceptions. Now, here's an important point we want to emphasize. These claims were not invented by the church. The idea that Jesus is the only way to get to the one God was not invented later by the believers in Christ, or by the words the New Testament church. Indeed, it was central to his message. Therefore, again, according to the New Testament, which recorded the words of Jesus, the eyewitnesses who were there record, recorded exactly what he said and what he did. There's no other way to reach God except through Jesus. Now, whether a person believes it or not, the record is clear. Jesus himself believed and taught that only through him could a person have their sins forgiven and come to know the living God. The New Testament uh, writers also proclaimed that same truth. And so there are two basic questions then that need to be answered. Since these are Jesus' claims about himself, there are two basic questions that every human being must answer about him. Question one, who do you think that Jesus is? Who do you think that he is? Now, this first question, Jesus actually asked his disciple this, this question when they're in Caesarea Philippi. Matthew records the following. He, that is Jesus, said to them, but who do you say that I am? Matthew 16, 15. In other words, who is Jesus Christ to you? Question two, what will you do with Jesus? Pontius Pilate asked the second question, and Matthew also records it in Matthew 27, 22. What, shall, what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ or the Messiah? Matthew 27, 22. So according to scripture, the eternal destiny of each individual depends upon how we answer these questions. So what is your verdict? What have you done with Jesus? Is he your savior? All right, let's summarize question three. According to the New Testament, who is Jesus? The stated person, the purpose of the New Testament is to create belief in the reader that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. Those who believe this message will receive eternal life. This is why the New Testament was written, to cause people to believe in him. Now, as we look at the various writings which make up the New Testament, we note the consistent theme that Jesus is the one way to reach the one God. To begin with, Jesus himself made these claims. Indeed, we find Christ saying that it is through him and him alone that a person can receive forgiveness of sin. He claimed also to be the way, the truth, and the life. He said that nobody could get to God the Father except through him. Jesus also said that those who believe in him presently have everlasting life. Now, there is no doubt whatsoever that Jesus believed and taught that, that he was, again, the one way to reach the one God. This is clear from what we know from the four Gospels. He believed that he was the one way to reach the one God. But we also find this teaching continued after Jesus ascended into heaven. In the book of Acts, we find a number of speeches and sermons that are recorded. Each speaker made it plain to his audience that salvation is given through Jesus Christ and through him alone. There is no other way. There is no other Savior. The writings of the Apostle Paul teach the same truth. Paul said that Jesus is the one intermediary, the one go-between, between the one true God and the human race. In other words, to reach God, you have to go through Jesus. We also find that the writer to the Hebrews made the same claim. Jesus is the one who will save anyone who comes to God the Father through him. So these are merely just a few of the references of the many references that we find in the New Testament about the importance of Jesus in reaching God the Father. To this, we could add a whole lot more, but the point, I think, is clear. Jesus believed he was the one way to get to the one God. The book of Acts uh, emphasized that also. The writings of Paul echoed that, and so did the writer to the Hebrews. And so, to sum up, the specific claim of the New Testament is that there is only one God who exists, and only one way to get to the one God through the person of Christ. 
You know what that means? It means all others are pretenders. Indeed, there is no salvation for sin outside of the person of Christ. This is their claim. This is not something that the church has invented. This is the claim of Jesus, his apostles, and the writers of the New Testament. Therefore, two basic questions about Jesus need to be answered by each individual. The first is, who do you think that he is? And the second question is, what would you do with him? How we answer these two questions, according to the Bible, determines how Jesus will judge each and every one of us. Therefore, it's essential that we have the correct or the right answers to these questions. So, very clearly, according to the New Testament, Jesus is the Savior, the one way to reach the one true God. Now we're going to begin to answer question number four here, as we have a few minutes left. And this one's going to take a little while, but it's an important question that needs to be answered as we uh, come to our next issue. Was Jesus a human being? All right. Throughout the centuries, there have been those who questioned the humanity of Jesus. Some have contended that he was not fully human, but only appeared to be this way. Is this what the New Testament teaches? To the contrary, the Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ, God the Son, was fully human. This can be seen in the following ways. Jesus had a human birth. He had a human ancestry. Jesus developed like a normal human being. As the promised Messiah, Jesus had to be human. Jesus Christ had the essential elements of a human being, body and a spirit. He also was given human titles. He was called a man, and finally he showed all the traits of being human. Now we're going to list the details of these claims we just made, we just note, noted that the New Testament made about him. So we'll give the following details that support these truths about Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus had a natural human birth and childhood. To begin with, we find that the circumstances around the birth and childhood of Jesus show that he was fully human. The evidence is as follows. Our first heading, Jesus was given, was given a human name before his birth. Now, before the child Jesus was born, the angel of the Lord told Joseph that Mary, to whom he was engaged to, was going to have a child. Furthermore, Joseph was instructed to name him Jesus. We read the following in Matthew. She will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. Consequently, he was given a human name, Jesus that was, given the human name Jesus before his birth. Now, also we find that Jesus had a normal human birth. Although he was supernaturally conceived, the biblical account of his birth demonstrates that he was fully human, a fully human child uh, with a normal human birth. Luke records the circumstances around his birth as follows. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 7, it said, And she, that is Mary, gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. That's Luke chapter 2 and verse 7. So his birth, according to the Bible, was a natural human birth, just like any other child. There was nothing spectacular about his physical birth. Then our next point, Jesus was a human child, according to the scripture. When the shepherds saw the newborn babe, they quickly spread the news to others. Luke records the following, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, Luke 2, 17. This further emphasizes that Jesus Christ was indeed a genuine child. Now, we also find when he was eight days old, he was circumcised like other Jewish male children, or according to Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 22. Eight days after his birth, the child was circumcised and named Jesus. This was the name the angel had given him before his mother became pregnant. After the days required by Moses' teaching to make a mother clean had passed, 
Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem. They took Jesus to present him to the Lord. That's Luke chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. So in this description of his birth, there is no hint that he was anything other than human. While Mary supernaturally conceived the child, his birth was normal. Indeed, the shepherds spread the word about a child that was born. And in the temple, when he was dedicated in the same manner as in, it was in the same manner as any other male child. Again, although his conception was supernatural, his birth was that of a fully normal human child. The Apostle Paul would later write in Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. This is another testimony to his humanity. All right, we're going to stop there on this edition of What Everyone Needs to Know About Jesus. We'll pick up next time about Jesus having a human ancestry and more things about his humanity. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Don Stewart. If you haven't subscribed yet to our YouTube channel, please do and tell others about this program and the other programs we're doing, the various episodes. Until that time, again, we'll see you soon. And may the Lord richly, richly bless you.